Russia. Fantastic. Good evening, Tatiana and Valerie from Germany. So we're going to go live across now to um, Orlando Pearson, uh, who is over in, in, uh, in Baker Street. So good evening, everybody, and welcome to an evening with Sherlock Holmes. I'm absolutely delighted to have with me Orlando Pearson. And Orlando will be taking us through uh, a number of uh, fantastic talks on Sherlock Holmes. And then we're going to have a live performance um, of a Sherlock Holmes sketch uh, with some other actors as well. So good evening, Orlando. Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for joining me. Good morning, if it's morning where you are, and good afternoon, and whatever, wherever else people are. It's thrilling to have so many people from so many different places dialing in. And I'm looking forward to presenting my evening with Sherlock Holmes. Uh, now, I'm going to start in a rather unusual place. I'm going to start with the story of the Kit Kat bar. Not many people, I think, would associate Sherlock Holmes with the Kit Kat bar. It's not mentioned in any of the stories. But the Kit Kat bar has been the most popular chocolate bar in Britain for nearly 100 years. It was originally launched as the Round Tree Crisp in the late 1920s. It rapidly acquired the name the Kit Kat bar and it remained pretty much the same for 70 years. The version you can see on the right there and is, it, it, is what, came, what it became in the 1990s. Uh, the recipe was changed once. It was changed in the late 1940s when it was easier to get hold of cocoa than of milk so they put more chocolate in. Like generally they try and take chocolate out these days but th then, they put then, then they put chocolate in. In the 1990s, Nestle, was, Nestle uh, the Swiss chocolatiers, took over Roundtree and in, in the late 90s they changed the packaging. So it went from that to that. Now, we're about to embark on a little course in Holmesian logic. And while I'm talking about Holmesian, Sherlock Holmes and Conan Doyle and Holmesian logic, I'd like you to think what effect that might have had. What effect did that change of, of, of packaging have? And the packaging has remained the same since. I, have, I went to my local supermarket today. There is the Kit Kat bar that I bought. And it is unchanged from the bar you can see on the right. But when Nestle switched from the packaging on the left to the packaging on the right. There was a dramatic change. Please don't shout this out if you know it. I, I presented, I'll give you a little clue. I'll give you two little clues. One clue is this, the solution is quite Holmesian. And the other clue is that I presented this to this, I did a talk similar to this to uh, an audience which had lots of people who owned confectionery shops. And they guessed immediately what what happened when uh, Nestle changed the packaging on their Kit Kat. Uh, but I, 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 I'll, I, I'll let, let's see whether uh, uh, exposure to Holmesian logic over the next half hour or so will, 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 will lead you to the answer. So there's Arthur Conan Doyle. He was born in 1859. Uh, he created, he wrote historic novels and he thought they were much more interesting, much better than his Sherlock Holmes stories. He wrote his detective stories as pot boilers over 30 years, and his careless indifference to them shows in some of the things that happened. So at one point, Watson's, Watson has been wounded in Afghanistan, is wounded in the shoulder. At another point, he's wounded in the lower leg. Uh, at one point, the landlady is called Mrs. Hudson. At another point, she's called Mrs. Turner. Uh, uh, Watson is introduced as John Watson, but his wife refers to him as James. And yet, who remembers Sir Nigel or The White Company, which are two historical novels in uh, Alexander Scott's style, uh, that, in Walter Scott's style, that Conan Doyle would be preferred to remember, to be remembered by. They, they've disappeared. But Conan Doyle launched Sherlock Holmes on the World in 1887. He launched a novel. He wrote it in three weeks. It was called A Study in Scarlet. Writing a novel in three weeks is about 60,000 words. Uh, to write in three, that in three weeks is, is going some. My stories take me about two months a time. They're about 10,000 words. So he, he, he must have produced that in a white heat of inspiration. Beaton's Christmas Annual bought all the rights to the story for 25 pounds. That's two and a half thousand pounds in today's money roughly, or about $3,000. So a bit more, perhaps $3,500. So it's a, 
it's a, it's a nice sum to have, but it's not exactly life-changing. It was a good bit of business for Beaton's Christmas Annual. The proprietor of Beaton's Christmas Annual was the husband of Mrs. Beaton, who wrote the famous cookery book. So that's two good bits of business. Be uh, Mrs. Beaton made the money on her cookery book. Mr. Beaton made the money out of buying the, a, a story for £25 that's never been out of print. So for, for 75 years, they, could have, they had the copyright on that story. It's now, so now, any, now anyone can produce a version of it. But for 75 years, was, Beaton's got a royalty on everything, every time that that book was printed. So Conan Doyle himself was rather upset when he saw the success of it. Um, and he tried again with another detective story. It was called, Lip it was called The Sign of Four. It's a story set, set partly in India, he wrote it again in about three thousand in, in, in about three weeks. It's about sixty thousand words. Again, uh, it, 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 it was respectfully received. Uh, this time, he made a hundred pounds out of it, so about ten thousand pounds. And I think actually he intended that would be it for his Sherlock Holmes stories. At the end of uh, the Sign of Four, Doctor Watson has met his wife lady called Mary Morstan, and he, he says he's going to, going to marry her, and Holmes congratulates him, and Watson says, well, what's in this for you? You've solved the crime. I've got a wife out of it. What's in it for you? And Holmes says, well, for me, there remains the cocaine bottle, and he reaches slim white hand up to the shelf to get it. I've always found that one of the most chilling lines of all literature, that you've got a man celebrating his marriage, another man taking comfort in a 7% solution of cocaine. But about a year later, Holmes had dinner with the proprietor, or lunch with the proprietor of the Strand magazine. And at the lunch was Oscar Wilde. And out of that lunch came not only the portrait of Dorian Gray, which first appeared in the Strand magazine, but we got the Sherlock Holmes short stories. The Strand Magazine was a publication that came out each month, as well as Wilde and Conan Doyle. E. Nesbitt, who wrote The Five Children and It, Rudyard Kipling, who wrote The Jungle Book, P.G. Woodhouse, who wrote Jeeves and Worcester, and Agatha Christie were all published in it. So if you, if you wanted to make, make a success out of, if you, if you, if you wanted to be a success as a, as, a, as a literary figure, appearing in the Strand Magazine was a pretty good way of doing it. The cover you can see there is the cover for The Valley of Fear, where you can see Sherlock Holmes rather, rather follically challenged Sherlock Holmes deciphering a code with, with, with his pipe. Uh, that's, that's quite a late edition. That must be from about 1915, because that's when the, the sign of four appeared. But it was the Strand magazine that did it for, 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 for Holmes. Uh, within, for Conan Doyle rather, within a year, he was, so, he was becoming so wealthy, he started designing drawing up plans for this house. This house is called Undershaw, it's near Hindhead. And 5% of the proceeds of my, of, of my works go to its restoration. It was in a state of disrepair. Uh, it was, it's, it's now been magically restored and it's a school for children with special needs. And I was lucky enough to be at the opening four years ago. And it is, I found it a very moving experience to be in a historic place like that, um, where, where children who really do need special attention are getting that, the special attention that they need. Another 5% of the proceeds of my book go to the Happy Life Children's Home in Nairobi. And that's a foundation which Steve has been closely involved with as well. And uh, uh, it, it's, a, it's a fantastic hospital, it's a fantastic school for founding children. Children found on the streets of Nairobi can go there uh, and they, they, they are properly looked after and given an education. But Conan Doyle himself got terribly fed up with, 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 with Sherlock Holmes. He felt that it was preventing him doing better things. And so he decided to kill um, Sherlock Holmes off. And his state of mind is perhaps indicated by his diary entry for the day he completed the story which killed Sherlock Holmes off. He plunges Sherlock Holmes over the Reichenbach Falls with his adversary, Moriarty, and all that, all, all that Conan Doyle wrote in his diary for that day was killed Holmes. And he moved on to write other things. And actually, in that house 
at Undershaw. He didn't write all that much Sherlock Holmes, and I'll come to that in a minute. But he focused very much on his, on his historical novels, which I think very few of us have read. I, I, I confess I haven't. I have read some of Conan Doyle's science fiction, which I'm not a huge science fiction fan, but it is, it is quite good. There's a, a pterodactyl which cheers me up in one, of his, in, in one of his science fiction stories, and it's worth a read. But they, they, no one would read them today if it weren't for the fact he also, that Conan Doyle also produced Sherlock Holmes. But you can imagine with a house like that and not writing Sherlock Holmes stories that Conan Doyle needed the money. That the house cost a fortune to build and Conan Doyle suddenly stopped earning from Sherlock Holmes. He wasn't producing any more stories. So he wrote a prequel to um, the Sherlock Holmes stories. The Hound of the Baskervilles uh, is set in 1884, so in 1889. Uh, so it predates the, the short stories, which are set more in the 1890s. I don't know of anyone else, certainly before, who'd ever written a prequel. But the, the, the Sherlock Holmes brand was obviously strong enough to be able to write a story which set earlier in time. And when he wrote it, people queued up overnight to get the latest instalments. It was, it's, it's, quite, it's quite a long novel. It's, 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 it's slightly longer than the other ones. Uh, and it appeared in instalments over several months before being published in a book with that really rather scary cover on the front. I have to say that, that the, the, the picture of the hound uh, is it, it, there, I think, is, is, is quite a threatening one. I've written a sequel to The Hound of the Baskervilles. It's called The Hounding of Piers Baskerville. It's set 20 years after 1889, and the main character in it is the son of Henry Baskerville. Uh, and I, I, use, I, I use the hound on the cover, but I think it, it is such a dramatic picture. But uh, Conan Doyle had his house to build and he had a sick wife who she had, she had tuberculosis and they needed to go off to places like Switzerland regularly so she could get mountain air and so he needed the money. So Conan Doyle then fished Holmes out of the Reichenbach Falls. He found that Mrs. Watson got in the way so he killed her off and he made a fortune and he continued writing short stories for the, ne uh, uh, for the next 20 years or so. He, he, he produced the last one in 1930 he ended up being paid by the word, uh, which is a nice situation to be in. And he finished up writing 56 short stories and four novels. And by the end, he was paid a thousand pounds per story. It's about a hundred thousand pounds in modern money. And he could have got more. Uh, and the, the, the 60 short stories have inspired all sorts of people. They've inspired me to write my stories. One person has written a limerick on every one of the 60 Sherlock Holmes stories. Uh, there are versions of Sherlock Holmes, a version of Sherlock Holmes called Swear a Lot Holmes, which MX Publishing has done. There's a version where Sherlock Holmes and all the, all the Baker Street characters are turned into animals. There's a version of Sherlock Holmes in Lego. All sorts of people have been inspired by Sherlock Holmes. But it was a Strand magazine that did it for Conan Doyle, and it was money that was the motivation. I don't think it's particularly unworthy to write for money. Winston Churchill or, or Samuel Johnson, depending on who you believe, both said that only a fool writes for anything other than money. That's not quite the motivation for me, as you, as you saw. But I think the money enabled Conan Doyle to do other things, though not necessarily produce historical novels. So he, one of the good works he did was he got an Indian solicitor cleared of, of a crime which had been falsely imprisoned. There's, there's a very good book about it. Um, but um, which just, just describes how um, the, 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 the man Abdul, who was a Gujarati solicitor practicing in Birmingham, was um, accused of mutilating animals and Conan Doyle got him off. He worked, Conan Doyle worked as a volunteer doctor in the Boer War and campaigned against the Belgian exploitation of the indigenous population of the Belgian Congo. And it was for those activities, rather than for creating Sherlock Holmes, that he became Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Uh, so the money enabled him to do other things. He was, was, was real, a real Renaissance man. He played cricket at a high level and he played football for Portsmouth. He appeared in goal for Portsmouth as an amateur under, under an assumed name. So Holmes was, uh, Holmes was, I think, a means to an end for Conan Doyle. And it begs the question, what's so special about Sherlock Holmes? So that's the question for me. This is one of the things I'm trying to go and answer tonight. Why is Sherlock Holmes enduringly popular? And the, simple, the first and simplest answer is they are great stories. When you read 
Sherlock Holmes, you want to know whether there's a hound on Dartmoor or where the submarine plans are or why groups of red-haired men are, are gathering together in London to, form the, to, to join the Red-Headed League. And there are great details in the stories. The, they often start with a deduction which turns out to have very little to do with the plot that follows. But they are great tricks. So he, he deduces the state of a man's marriage by the state of his hat. Uh, he induces that a man has worked, has done manual labour by the size of his hands. And these are useful tricks to play. I, 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 I for many years, travelled on, on the train into London. And I spent, if you're on a train into London, you can, you can stand and that's about it. You can't, you can't read, generally. You can in Covid times, but generally you can't read. Uh, so I spend my time looking at my fellow passengers and trying to deduce things about them. I once deduced that uh, a lady standing opposite me was a left-handed catering worker, which had a blue plaster on her right thumb. Uh, I wanted to introduce that a man was a New Zealander by the fact that he had uh, a, a silver fern on his cufflinks. And I once introduced that a, a lady was going on a blind date. But early on a Monday evening, she was smartly dressed with a mobile phone and a London street finder close to hand. And I thought, well, she's obviously, she's obviously going somewhere on Monday evening to meet somebody early. And uh, she, she obviously doesn't know where she's meeting him. I guess she wants to stay in contact. She probably doesn't know what he looks like. And that moment, the phone rang. And she said, well, what do you look like? Where, should, where are we going to meet? So I thought, well, that's, that, that, that's one for me. I also was on, a, on another commuter train. I was on it. There were people who were getting on and off the train. And I, I, the, the train itself was very crowded. So I would spend my time looking at people, what people were wearing to deduce where they might get off the train in, in the hope that I might, get, might take their seats. So it, it, it is a useful trip you can do. But I have to say that that was about 10 years work and it was pretty thin pickings. So, but they are great details in the stories. The other thing, next thing is that Colo was a very fine writer. That there are lots of, if you get an Oxford Dictionary quotations, the number that come out of the Sherlock Holmes stories is very, very long. You've got the three pipe problem, the dog in the night time, you see but do not observe, you know my methods, apply them. They've all entered the English language. There's about three or four pages of, of Conan Doyle quotes in the, uh, in the Oxford Dictionary quotations. It's not quite Shakespeare, but it's quite a lot. And I'm, I'm sure that Conan Doyle, when he was writing it, wasn't anticipating that that would happen. They are great characters. Conan Doyle had, had time on his hands just as Holmes and Watson did. Conan Doyle wanted to be an eye doctor and he opened a surgery in Wimpole Street and in a year he didn't see a single client. Not a single patient came to use his services and he put, his, he put all that time into his characters and not just Holmes and Watson are great characters. You, uh, uh, what, what the, the relation between them is great, they, they, they're affectionate, they're quite caustic with it. Holmes is quite caustic with Watson. You do want to read on about them. The small characters are interesting as well. You've got the rather shouty Lestrade, you've got the very quiet and analytical Gregson, and you, you, you do want to follow the characters. And I think the other th strange thing about Holmes and Watson is they do present an alternative lifestyle. Most marketing is aimed at families with kids or adults who are out to enjoy themselves. And here you have two men who enjoy each other's company uh, and they solve crimes for years and years and years. And they seem to be satisfied with that. Uh, it, it, is, it is very much an alternative to the sort of lifestyle you see portrayed in most books and in most on, on television or in the cinema. The other thing you can do, one of the things that has spawned the Sherlock Holmes industry is that the story's out of copyright. There, there are uh, that, 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 that there are 75 years or 70 years with most, with, with, with most writers before you can use their characters. Uh, Conan Doyle died in 1930, so you, you, you've been able to just, just write as you want to over the years. And that, that does mean it, 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 it is very copyable and, and it, it, is, it is a doable thing, which it isn't for, 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 for many other writers. You couldn't do Poirot without paying the, the Agatha Christie estate a huge amount of money. You could do Shakespeare, but no one seems to be terribly interested in producing Shakespeare. Uh, you, could do, you could do Dickens, but no one seems to want to produce another version of Nicholas Nickleby. So th th there is something special about Sherlock Holmes which makes people want to, want to do it. Um, and they are great comfort literature. They, they do 
present problems which have a difficult solution. And I was going to go on and produce 14 different reasons why the Sherlock Holmes stories became enduringly popular. And then COVID came along and COVID is, is a difficult time. It, it is a time when things have really gone all awry. And there is a man called Vincent Starrett, who was a Canadian writer of the 1930s, and he put the, the appeal of the Sherlock Holmes stories into a sonnet, and he called it 221b. Now you might like to think, as I go through this, what living or dead person could be identified just by their street number? Possibly the British Prime Minister, who lives at 10 Downing Street, you try and name a single other, you try and name the, the address of a single other fictional character. I, I can't do it. But 221b tells everyone that it's Sherlock Holmes. And the poem goes as follows. Here dwell together still two men of note who've never lived and so can never die. How very near they seem, yet how remote that age before things all went awry. And yet, the game's afoot for those with ears attuned to hear the distant view halloo. England is England for all our fears, and only what your heart believes is true. The yellow fog swirls past the window pane as night descends upon this fabled street. A lonely hansom splashes through the rain. The ghostly gas lamps fail at 20 feet, and yet, Though the world explodes, these two shall survive. And it's always 1895. So, back to the Kit Kat bar. Quick refresher on the Kit Kat bar and on Holmes's methods. Two things you need to do. Eliminate the impossible and look for the motivation. Now, uh, we've established that it's not the recipe for the Kit Kat bar that changed. It's not the name for the Kit Kat bar that's changed. So what is it that has induced this change? Think about eliminating the impossible and think about the motivation. What, what, it, it, generally in Conan Doyle, the motivation is money. So what's, what's, the, what's the motivation for, what, what's the motivation for, 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 for the change of the Kit Kat bar? I've given you clues. It's quite, it's quite opposite to some of the things I said about Sherlock Holmes, and a group of confectioners got this immediately. Has anyone suggested an answer to the Kit Kat puzzle, Steve? Uh, I think we'll give everybody a chance on the chat window. Yeah. Okay. Um, got a minute. Yeah, please fire in to the chat, chat window. So we've got Collins, the fastest one in, with size. No, nothing to do with size. It's, it's, uh, it's all four uh, fingers. Okay, the conservation, less packaging. The sweet is in a new packaging. It's metal packaging. It's just cheaper. Any of those? None of those. The, the change made the consumption of Kit Kat bars decline by 20%. So you can right. imagine the hit of marketing at Nestle wasn't all that popular with the change. Okay, so we've got loads coming in now. We've got the weight. Is it because it was sealed? Is it no. safer packaging? Is it the shape of it? No. There's a clue in, in something I said about Sherlock Holmes. Oh, they eliminated the foil. They've eliminated, that's very good. And, and what, what, what's, what, what, what's the significance of that? Oh, so it looks smaller, so people think they're getting more from it. Shall I, shall I explain? If, if you oh. are... <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic one from Stephen. It's incredible. You can microwave it. <laughs> well, that's, that's, true. that's wonderful. I hadn't thought of that. Yes. That's wonderful. Um, you could rewrap it from Miriam. Yeah. And all these are possible. They're, they're, they're not. The, 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 the people at Nestle were baffled by this. The answer was that if you're a heroin smoker, you need a, a, a source of clean silver foil. And the old version of the Kit Kat bar was the cheapest source, of, 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 was the cheapest out-of-pocket expense for getting a Kit Kat bar. So in, 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 place, in nice places, the sales are virtually unaffected. In the poorest parts of town is where the Kit Kat bar sale went through the floor. It was so widely used for people who were, who were drug abusers, which is why 
um, Conan Doyle made Holmes a drug abuser. He injects himself with cocaine. That's why I said there was a clue in Sherlock Holmes' lifestyle. To Nestle's credit, they didn't go back to back to the silver foil. They didn't they they didn't know what had happened to, to some kind of soul wrote to them and said this was the explanation. But it did absolutely clobber their sales. They didn't know they didn't know what it was. I, yeah. I've worked in the marketing. I, I've worked in marketing of consumer products for many years, and you, 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 you watch your unit sales every month. And if something like that happened to us, you'd be terrified. So uh, so so the Kit Kat on the left hand side had foil. And the new Kit Kat didn't have foil, and no. the and the the Kit Kat without the foil, the sales went down significantly because there was not any foil for the drug users to use for their fix. Exactly so. Yes, it, it's quite it's quite scary how 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 big the, the decline was, just how many drug users there are out there. Uh, and I said the, the, the confectioners I presented this to all knew the answer straight away, and probably some of them would have, had, had, they, some of them would have taken a kicking in the pocket. Whether this, whether it, whether the demand, of, whether the foil use migrated to another brand, I don't know. But it it was uh, it absolutely stuns the, the Nestle people. Wow. So I, I'd like to talk a little bit about Sherlock Holmes and, and religion now. Because one of the things I, 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 I do regard Holmes as being something of a redeeming spirit. My, my, my wife has said that uh, when, I'm, when I get down, I always read Sherlock Holmes. And she mentioned that to my mother. My mother said, oh, so your, your father did the same thing, she said. So it's, it's obviously, I, I do feel that, hope that, that Sherlock Holmes does, does have a redeeming spirit about him. Conan himself was brought up a Roman Catholic. He went to Stonyhurst School which is one of the biggest Roman Catholic schools in England. Uh, he was an avowed atheist for a while. Then in the First World War, his son, um, his, his son got wounded and he uh, subsequently died and, he, and Conan Doyle turned to the occult. The Sherlock Holmes model of providing a solution to the inexplicable is something that, uh, is, is something that, I, 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 that, that really is, is very rare. And in some of the Sherlock Holmes stories, that they get very close to being biblical. So, um, in, in one of the stories, um, one story is called the Crooked Man, and that's the story. That, that's a Holmesian telling of the story of David and Bathsheba. In another story, another Sherlock Holmes story, called um, the Blue Carbuncle, the story ends with with, with Sherlock Holmes finding out who's, who's stolen the, the jewels. And he then says to Holmes, well, it's Chris, he then says to Watson, well, it's Christmas, I'm gonna let this man go. I may just be saving a soul when I do that. Now you might like to think, you might like to think who else might plausibly say that they were saving a soul. I can't think of any other character in literature, though I can think of character in the Bible who could say that they, that, 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 that they, were, that they were saving souls. One of the other stories that I, I like particularly is called the Beryl Coronet. And in that one, Holmes discovers, uh, Holmes is petitioned by a wealthy banker, Alexander Holder, about a piece of jewellery that's, that's gone missing. And the banker, Alexander Holder, has a son who he doesn't get on with and an adopted daughter who he does get on with. And he, he believes that it's his adoptive, it is his son who's stolen the jewellery. And he finds out that it's Holmes, to, to Mr. Holder's horror, finds out that it's the beloved niece who's, who's, who's stolen his jewellery instead. Uh, and at the end, Holmes says that, that there will, that Holmes says that there, there will be a punishment coming for, uh, the, for, 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 for the adopted daughter. And the story we, that I'm going, the sketch we're going to do now, we're going to be joined by Chris Howard and, uh, as Mr. Divine and Kenneth Mould as Dr. Watson, is called, it's called Mr. Divine's Original Problem. And it actually is a sort of sequel to The Beryl Coronet. Uh, it features, it could have been called The Most Illustrious Client. There is a story called The Illustrious Client, but the client in this story is even more illustrious than the illustrious client of the, in, 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 of the, of the illustrious client story. Now, I'd like to thank everyone for listening, and please don't forget our good causes, Stepping Stone School and the Happy Life Children's Home. But we're now going to do, Kenneth, Kenneth Chris and I are now going to do the, the story 
of uh, Mr. Devine's original problem. And my daughter, Philippa, will be playing some soothing music in the background. So I'm going to move slightly to one side. <laughs> Kenneth will join me. And we will start with Mr. Devine's original problem. Got to? Okay. If you unshare Orlando, your screen. Well, how do I do that? New share? Sorry, Steve, could you? There we go. Share screen. There we go. Okay. I note, Good Watson, that our client, Mr. Devine, is a creative spirit whose strong hands are skilled at the plane and the lane. His use of these old tools leads me to suspect that he is rather older than his outward appearance would suggest. And the alluvial mud I see adhering to his boots shows me that he comes from the Middle East, for nowhere else is there a place where there are four different river heads, one of which flows through gold-bearing rock. What you say, Mr. Holmes, has the accuracy for which you are famed. My boots bear traces of mud from four rivers that have their headwaters in the Middle East. The Pishon is known for its gold. Aromatic resin and onyx are also there. The other rivers are the Gihon, the Tigris, and the Euphrates. And even if your eyes tell each of you that I am the same age as each of you, I can confirm that I am indeed a good deal older than people take me for. It was in the land bounded by the flow of these rivers years ago beyond measure and as an outcome of my creative bent, that the events on which I would consult with you occurred. For it was then that I made a creation in my own image. You mean you painted a self-portrait? I hardly think, Watson, that Mr. Devine would have made his way all the way from the Middle East to London to consult with us on a self-portrait. I assume, Mr. Devine, that your creation was of a greater significance than a self-portrait, and the matter on which we should consult with us on is consequently also of a greater significance. That is so. I would not wish to go into any more detail on the creative process itself, but the results of it were a man and a woman for whom I found quarters in a well-watered garden. All would have been well if the two had not made a <clears throat> self-discovery. At this point, our client gave us an account of the nature of the self-discovery, which I could not possibly disclose in a work intended for publication in this last decade of the 19th century. In any case, precise details have no bearing on the petition that followed. I am here to ask you, Mr. Holmes, what response I should make to the two. Their self-discovery is an act of disobedience which requires chastisement. I therefore have banished them from the place they lived and will not allow them back. Does that not seem rather final? In my realm, my powers are supreme and my judgments binding, but I am able to adjust whatever I choose to adjust at any time after the event, and in any way that I choose. So if I may summarise your petition, Mr. Devine, is that you wish me to suggest a suitable punishment for these creations of yours whom you regard as malefactors? That is so. Perhaps in the narratives of your friend here, there are cases which parallel my petition? There was, of course, the case of the Beryl Coronet. There, Mary Holder, the much-loved niece and adopted daughter of my client, the wealthy banker, Mr. Alexander Holder, 
stole a valuable piece of jewellery which was in his possession but which did not belong to him. She passed it to the ruined gambler, Sir George Burnwell. She allowed my client's son, Alexander, to take the blame for the jewellery's theft and then eloped with Sir George. I commented at the time that this display of free will might of itself bring a suitable punishment down on her. What relevance has that to my petition? If free will can itself serve as a punishment, and that will spare you the need to devise a punishment of your own. You make yourself very plain. But whatever punishment you deem fitting, Holmes, and however it is to be exacted, you have failed to specify any duration. Surely no misdemeanor would permit, would merit uh, a punishment without end. What happened to your client's son, who was falsely accused of stealing the coronet? He subsequently tracked down his cousin Mary, although she had asked that no attempt be made to do so. He was in love with her, but she would not have him. Nevertheless, this love for her caused him to intercede with his father, and your client was eventually prevailed upon to allow her back into his house, where she was able to lead a life of some peace. As well as my two creations, I also have a natural son. Maybe, at some point, I will prevail upon him to intercede on behalf of the two expellees from the garden of whom I spoke, just as love drove Arthur Holder to intercede for his cousin with his father. Another instant, and Mr. Devine had gone into the night. It was love that motivated Arthur Holder to intercede for his cousin, even though she'd allowed him to take the blame for something which she was responsible for, and even though she did not return his love. Now I think I will dedicate my attention to music. I have never loved a specific person, Good Watson, yet love, in the wider sense of the word, brings out the best in all of us, in terms of forgiveness, generosity, and advocacy of others. It protects, trusts, hopes, and perseveres. Thank you so much, Orlando. That was a fantastic performance and a fantastic set of um, presentations. Um, very happy to open up to a, a quick uh, Q&A. So if uh, any of the people on the, uh, online from the 12 countries that we have um, will have any questions for Orlando, please do let us know and uh, we'll see if we can answer those. So Orlando's back on, back, back, back on video, hopefully back on video. There we go. Fantastic. So you might, um, you may be on mute, Orlando. Hello, I'm, I'm back. Fantastic. So um, just to uh, reach out to everybody online, um, some really lovely messages coming through from uh, uh, the, the, the attendees. So uh, thank you very much for, for the nice messages. Um, any questions for Orlando that, uh, that, he, can, uh, he would like, that you would like him to answer? So lovely question from Miriam. Where can I purchase your books? That's, that's very sweet. Thank you. That's a, that's a very nice question. Good start. Uh, they are, there have been six volumes of the redacted Sherlock Holmes. They're available from MX Publishing. Uh, they're available online. They've been done as ebooks, as audios, and as print books. Uh, the, the audio books have been particularly successful. 
uh, as I mentioned, the reader of the, of the first five volumes of the audiobooks passed away in July. And for this six month period, uh, I am donating uh, the, the, the audio royalties for my books to the charity that Steve, that's, that Steve White asked donations he made to in his memory. So uh, if you want to buy audio books, that would be great, but they're also available as, as e-books and as print books, and they're available online. Uh, a very detailed question. How do you reconcile the creator of the world's greatest detective and logical machine with the ardent spiritualist who is often duped? That's a very good question. So as I then indicated, Conan Doyle got into the occult late in his life. And I think it was very common at that time um, for people to get into the occult because they, 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 this huge massacre of young men. So uh, Britain lost 600,000 men, mostly between the ages of well, 15 in some cases and 30 uh, in four years. And uh, Conan Doyle's eldest son, uh, who's called Kingsley, uh, succumbed to his wounds actually after the war. He was wounded in the war and, and uh, Conan Doyle, well, he had five children, never got any grandchildren. Uh, and I, I do think that it, 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 it came as a huge shock. I mean, Conan Doyle was a big practical joker and believed in all sorts of weird things. So he, he formed a friendship with Harry Houdini and then fell out with Harry Houdini when Houdini told him that all, all his escapes were tricks. He uh, he he, he, he um, believed in fairies. Uh, he he believed in the authenticity of, of, of cardboard pictures of fairies that they were real fairies. I think he was a very. I think Conan Doyle was a very interesting man. He, he, he as I mentioned, he was a very good sportsman. Uh, he owned the first. He was one of the first people to own a motor car. Uh, he uh, he, um, he 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 went to South Africa as a, as a doctor. He did all sorts of things, and a lot of it was because the, the Sherlock Holmes stories gave him an income which he could do things that he, he wouldn't otherwise have been able to do. He was a very prolific writer, as, as well as the Sherlock Holmes stories. He wrote, I think, about 10 historic novels. And he, he was one of the first real science fiction writers. And I just think that he, that he was into everything. And he, so he, 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 was, he, he was into all sorts of things that were quite unexpected. And so it is possible at one point to create the supreme magician, but actually um, believe in the occult as well. So you, 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 what you create and what you believe in it can be two different things. Um, and if you have any other questions that you want to put in, please put them into the question window, into the chat window. Um, uh, I have a, a, a particular question uh, 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 around Conan Doyle. Um, what do you think his, his favourite aspect of Sherlock Holmes was? Well, Conan Doyle really got into, although he, he, he frequently criticised um, Sherlock Holmes, he did get into the following that Sherlock Holmes had. So he devised his list of his own favourite Sherlock Holmes stories. Uh, he well, travelled widely to, to promote them. The first story which I mentioned, the, the study in Scarlet, is about uh, the Mormons in the United States. And he travelled all the way to Utah uh, to, to promote his books, and he expected a very frosty reception because uh, the study in Scarlet was very hostile, has a very hostile portrayal of the Mormons. And the, the Mormons, fortunately, were very adult about it and gave him a very good reception. But uh, he, he, he did have a, a strange relationship with, 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 with Sherlock Holmes and with Dr. Watson as well. He criticised Dr. Watson for never making a single joke uh, because Conan Doyle was very fond of jokes. He, he, he's believed to have planted in a, in a chalk quarry the Piltdown Man who was believed to be a, a half a man and half an ape for, for many years before the, the forgery was exposed. Uh, so he did do all sorts of things. And he, he, he could take a very detached view, but he obviously, he, he did write extensively about Sherlock Holmes' world. As I say, <clears throat> great, picking out his favorite 15 stories and saying, saying why. He, he felt the speckled band, which uh, it, it was, was my father's favorite story. It, it, it was, was the best because it was, it was so scary. My father, who was born in 1913, said that he, he, he lay awake at night worrying about the speckled band, so it obviously had an effect. Uh, but he, uh, Conan Doyle did take part in the marketing of Sherlock Holmes, even though he did try to kill him off. So we have a, 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 another, another question, which is, um, uh, 
which is your favourite Sherlock Holmes story out of the canon, the 56 short stories and four novellas? I started writing Sherlock Holmes stories about six years ago. And I, I, was, I started because I was... Um, I, I, because I, uh, because I, 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 at university I read a story called The Trial by Franz Kafka, which is a story about a man who wakes up one morning, is arrested and is put on trial and is never told what the charge is on what he was, on what he was, why he's being, why he's being prosecuted. I always thought, I always thought there was a logical solution to it. I then reread for the 37th time the complete Sherlock Holmes stories and I looked at the Red-Headed League and I believe that Kafka was influenced by the Red-Headed League uh, and the Red-Headed League provides a solution to the trial. And so my own story was called The Trial of Joseph Carr. Joseph Carr is the man who it, it, it was woken and arrested. And I like the Red-Headed League best of all. A, it's the funniest of the stories. Holmes and Watson themselves dissolve into laughter as the... As the uh, client presents his petitions and has the best villain. The villain who, who is found at the end is a man called John Clay, who's a, an odd mixture. He, he does good works and commits crimes. And he, he's very cavalier about his arrest. He congratulates Holmes on the way that the arrest is being carried out and leaves the stage with a sweeping bow. I would be rather sad that Conan Doyle didn't use jo, uh, John Clay in a, in, in, a, in a second Sherlock Holmes. Sorry, he never did, but the, the trial of Joseph Carr uh, um, does revive John Clay. It's, it's, it's the first one that I wrote. I showed it to several Kafka experts who were, who were kind enough to be very positive about it. Uh, so in, in, some, in some ways, because it's my first story, The Trial of Joseph Carr is my own favourite of my own stories, but The Red-Headed League is definitely my favourite of the Conan Doyle stories. And a and, uh, lovely comment from Colin. Um, I've I was totally fooled by your green screen. I thought you were sitting in the Sherlock Holmes pub in London. <laughs> yes, I have been to the Sherlock Holmes pub. Um, it's um, London life is all shut down at the moment. I haven't been for a while, but this, I, I'm sitting in my kitchen. I'm sitting in, 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 in the room of my house. It's not quite the kitchen, but next to the kitchen. And um, the uh, green screen does help. And a great question from Stephanie. Uh, of the modern authors who are writing their own version, pastiches of, of, of Sherlock Holmes stories. Who are some of those that you feel capture the, the feeling and the style and the perspective of the original stories the best? I think Richard Ryan does an excellent job uh, at, um, at, 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 at capturing the, the sweep. I mean, he, he, I, I've read the Vatican cameos. Uh, it takes Holmes to Italy. Uh, it, it takes him back into history. It does mix. It, it does mix things into into Sherlock Holmes. Richard's obviously tried very hard to capture the, the language of Conan Doyle. I think, I think that works. That works very very well. Um, I think of the recent films about him uh, and the recent TV programs. The the Sherlock the, the, the Sherlock programs bring Holmes magically up to date. I think that to have Holmes, well, have, 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 first of all, have Watson come back from either Afghanistan or Iraq is a very good, nice touch. To have 17 stairs leading up to the flat is a very nice touch. Uh, to have Holmes putting on three nicotine patches because he can't have a three pipe problem is a nice touch. I'm not so sure about the plots, but I think in, in terms of the effort made to appeal to people who love the original Sherlock Holmes stories, the Sherlock people have tried very, very hard. And a, a great question from, from JC uh, in uh, Paris is, who is your favourite actor that has played Sherlock Holmes and, and why? I love Jeremy Brett because mm. the, it, I, I, I like, I, I, I do like the, do, do love the Sherlock show, shows, but I do actually, I'm an authenticist myself uh, and I'm a Jeremy Brett man. I, I, I think that he's helped by the fact the plots are very close to the original stories. He was a real Holmesian. He loved the original home, Sherlock Holmes stories. There's a new biography out about him called Playing a Part. It's been very well received. Uh, and uh, one of the things it mentions is that Brett was always, whenever, whenever there was a change made to the plot, Brett always required a justification for it. I think that's rather a nice touch. 
Fantastic. And are there any other questions coming in and from the from the attendees? Um, we we have uh, fans from from twelve different countries attending. Uh, just going to give you, give a shout out to everybody from Belgium, the UK, USA, Germany, France, Philippines, Australia, Spain, Russia, the Czech Republic, and Portugal. So if there are any fans online from any other countries, please let us know and then we'll add to the number that we've got. Um, Orlando, what's your favorite story that you've written? Um, you've done 31, so what, what's your favorite? The first one it always has a special place in my heart. I've written one recently called The Sorceress and the Sea Lord. And that discloses for the first time, the, the French origins of the Sherlock Holmes name. Um, Sherlock Holmes was distantly related to the French painter Vernet. And Sherlock in French, I'm sure Jean-Christophe knows, means dear wreck. And I think Sherlock was actually a nickname. So I've, I've yet to establish what Sherlock Holmes's real name is. I, I, I like to take Sherlock Holmes abroad. I like him to uh, be interest, to, to, to take an interest in things that I'm interested in. Uh, I have him in some very dark places. So volume six has him at the, at the Belson concentration camp in 1945. I have him, uh, I, 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 I have him doing the cracking German codes at the outbreak of the First World War. Uh, that's in a story called An Encirclement Thwarted. Uh, so those are some of my favourites, but I also have him in, in, in business. I'm, a, I'm an accountant by training. So one of my stories, uh, what, 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 one of my stories has him rigging the, in, rigging the insurance market. It's called On Consistent Luck. And it, 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 has, it, it has Sherlock Holmes rigging the insurance market and a meerkat is involved. It, it's about price comparison websites. And you can do price comparison. You, 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 I don't have Sherlock Holmes in the modern day, but I do take modern themes back to Sherlock Holmes and, and, and have him do it. And so, I, and that, that features John Maynard Keynes. Uh, and uh, I, so, I, I mix a lot of real people with Sherlock Holmes. So, I have Ribbentrop, I have Goebbels, I have John Maynard Keynes, I have Winston Churchill, I have Queen Victoria, I have Edward Elgar, uh, I have. I have a prime minister trying to solve a difficult problem about Britain leaving a foreign alliance and that the gender of that prime minister is never named. That was about, that was just after the Brexit referendum. Uh, and I, 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 I do have homes mi mi mixed with, lo with lots of real historic people. And generally... So a couple, it's a couple, of, a couple more questions for you, Orlando. They're flying in now. Um, so... Um, who is your favourite Mycroft? Is the first one. Oh gosh. Um, well, I think Martin Gattis does a very good job of Mycroft in the Sherlock series. I, I, I meant to include this little story in, in my presentation, but uh, Gattis was obsessed with Sherlock Holmes. At the same age I became obsessed with Sherlock Holmes, about the age of fourteen. And he said that as a, as, as a teenager I was obsessed with, with Sherlock Holmes, and. Uh, in, in the end, he said, it's amazing I ever lost my virginity. I mean, that, that's what, what Sherlock Holmes can do to some people. He, 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 he can, it can make people obsessive. I think, my, I think he does a, One of the themes in my stories about Mycroft is that Mycroft is described as being in the British government. And in, in, the, in, the, in the Conan Doyle stories, that makes him a benign character. But actually, being the British government can often make you have to make some very, very difficult decisions. And Mycroft makes some difficult decisions which prove to be right, but they are rather unpleasant. So in, I, I wrote a successor, uh, I wrote a sequel to the Bruce Partington plans, and it's called The Sleeper's Cash. And anyone who knows the story of a special rendition will recognize a lot of the themes that, that, that Mycroft, that, that feature Mycroft in, in The Sleeper's Cash, because it's about special rendition. So a very, very topical question from Dorothy. Thank you very much. Um, as you mentioned, your daughter is doing the um, sound. Have you seen the Enola Holmes film yet on Netflix? And if you have, what do you think of it? Oh, gosh, I, I, I'm sorry, I haven't, but I, I certainly intend to. I, I have tried to interest my daughters in, uh, in, in my Sherlock Holmes works. Steve will confirm that I've, I've done 
various presentations on, on, on my, when, I, when I've launched my books in, in central London. My daughters always come along. They're, they're, they're now 14 and 12 and generally behave much older than that. And they, they put me on the spot with, with, with lots of difficult questions, just as I am this evening. I thoroughly enjoy it. Uh, Enola Holmes, I, I haven't heard of, but I will look it up immediately after we finished here to see me. So, so I got messaged by a, a lovely uh, writer, uh, uh, Bonnie McBird, uh, who's a great friend of, uh, of, of ours. And she mentioned that, uh, that anybody with a daughter should, should absolutely uh, get them to watch Enola Holmes. Okay, that's, that's, that's absolutely. Incredible adaptation. Um, so we have two more countries that have, uh, have stuck their hand up, Canada and Norway uh, on, on the line. Um, how old were you from John? Um, how old were you when you read your first homes? So I was 13, nearly 14, and I got mumps. And uh, my father said, well, you can, we've stuck at home for two weeks. People don't get mumps these days. They get, they get injected against it. But I, I, I got mumps. I, I was stuck at home with, with swollen glands and a sore throat. And uh, my father said, well, he gave me a number of books that he'd enjoyed at my age that he still had. And I read, I, I started the short stories and the first one I read was A Scandal in Bohemia. And it, I think A Scandal in Bohemia is not, is not a great one to start when you're 14. It's a very adult story. And it was then The Red-Headed League was the second one. The, the denouement of The Red-Headed League is absolutely brilliant. I didn't see it coming. I thought, wow, when I read that. And I, I, I devoured the rest of the short stories over the next week and much else to do. And that's what got me going. And I've reread all the Sherlock Holmes stories dozens of times. And people who read my stories will find, I will look for a suitable quote in the original stories to match a situation. So one of my stories, Holmes investigates the resurrection. There's lots of, there's lots of, there's lots of religion in my stories. I'm not particularly religious myself, but I am interested in it. Uh, and he, he investigates the resurrection. And I, I was able to take a whole paragraph out of Black Peter which was very, it was very opposite to Holmes's investigation of the tomb where Jesus was laid. And um, another fantastically modern question and relevant question from Martina. Um, I'm assuming from the Netherlands or from Belgium. I think maybe Belgium. Um, what would you? What would Sherlock Holmes say about Brexit? Well, I think Sherlock Holmes was probably originally a Brexiter. Um, in uh, the Noble Bachelor. Uh, he meets an American and he says what a pleasure it is to, 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 be, to meet an American and he says that he hopes one day Britain and the United States will become one worldwide country with their flag a quartering of the stars and strikes and the Union flag. Uh, and I took that up in my story called A Study in Red, White and Blue. When Brexit first happened, our, our then Prime Minister said that Brexit was, was going to, it wasn't going to be a red or a blue or a white Brexit, it could be a red, white and blue Brexit. So I wrote a story called A Study in Red, White and Blue. And Holmes goes across to the United States and meets a president uh, who bears a, a, a quite striking similarity to the current incumbent. It turns out to be rather more difficult to negotiate the union of the United States and the United Kingdom than uh, Holmes first imagined. And uh, it, it, I do come up with a solution to Brexit. Uh, I have written quite a lot of satirical stories. So I do, I, 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 I've done, I, I, as I said, I'm an accountant. So I've done, I've produced one recently about Enron. And I've done one, uh, I, I did one about Brexit. I did one about the first, the second Iraq war. The problem I found with doing satirical stories is that they date very quickly. So my, store, my, my study in red, white, and blue uh, had, um, my study in red, white, and blue had the, the, the then prime minister, Theresa May, uh, and it had the, 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 the person whom Holmes, is his, who's, who's Holmes' his adversary, is the man who was the trade secretary at the time. Uh, and uh, the, the trade secretary and the, and the prime minister are no longer there. So anyone who reads my story will now will say, well, this is all jolly interesting three or four years ago, but time's moved on, which it has. So I, 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 I haven't, my last volume six didn't have any satirical stories, but if, if, if Steve will let me do a volume seven, there will be a story about the Enron affair. Uh, it, it, this, year, this year is a story this year, it's 100 years since the first Charter Accountant, or the United States a certified accountant, 
was female, the first female chartered accountant was, was nominated, a lady called M. Harris Smith. I've just published a story called M. Harris Smith. It features her getting involved with a, with a company that operates in a way remarkably similar to Enron. And there are lots of references to which people rec who know about the Enron affair will recognize, but whether anyone will understand what I'm talking about in 20 years time, I'm not sure, but I hope my stories are still being read then. So um, we have a comment from, from John and then we have a question from Kate. So the comment from John is, whilst not, not politically, terribly political, I think what home was, was smarter than, than going for Brexit. Uh, and <laughs> the question from Kate, so I don't need to comment on that, uh, the question from Kate is, who is your favourite Holmes villain? Well, I mentioned John Clay in the Red-Headed League. Uh, I, 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 do, I, I did recommend my daughters start reading the Red-Headed League. Uh, but, but he, 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 most of Holmes, is, a lot of Holmes villains you never actually meet because they, they, they die or that they are, um, that, 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 that they, that, well, Holmes just never catches them. So in the five orange pips, he knows who's done it, but the people are killed in a shipwreck. Um, in the Red-Headed League, the villain is apprehended. And uh, he, ha he, he says to, uh, he, he insists upon being called Mr. Clay. And he says, don't put your handcuffs on me. I've got noble blood in my veins. And he, he really is a dashing criminal. And I, I think he's, I think it's a great shame that Conan Doyle didn't use him again. I said, tr try the trial of Joseph Carr. You, 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 you find out, you see, see the next instalment in the John Clay story uh, after, he's been after he's been sprung from prison. Fantastic. Well, um, are there any other questions? We'll just open it up for, for one, or, one more question on, on the question window on the chat, if there is any. Let's give it 30 seconds while people type. Let's see if there's any more questions coming through. Looks like, oh, here we go. There's just a thank you for everybody for a fantastic online event. Thanks for the uh, a great meeting, uh, Orlando, and a nice evening. Thank you so much, Orlando, for joining us online. And uh, we'll obviously uh, uh, cut the recording for you and uh, get it up on there. And for those of you that have really enjoyed this evening, uh, just a little reminder that, uh, that there is a link there for our um, two charities that, that Orlando and uh, MX Publishing support. And uh, we would uh, love it if you could make a small donation there and we'll split it between Stepping Stones and Happy Life in Kenya. Thank you so much for everybody joining us. It's incredible that we've had fans from 14 different countries joining us. This is amazing. And uh, especially under lockdown, there's some lovely comments coming in about having such a nice evening in COVID times. Thank you so much there from Patricia. Um, I look forward to seeing you again next time. Thank you, Orlando. Thank you. Thank you very much. I thoroughly enjoyed it.